4, 1 to 7. One day, the widow of a member of the group of prophets came to Elisha and cried out, My husband who served you is dead, and you know how he feared the Lord. But now a creditor has come, threatening to take my two sons as slaves. What can I do to help you, Elisha asked. Tell me, what do you have in the house? Nothing at all except a flask of olive oil, she replied. And Elisha said, borrow as many empty jars as you can from your friends and neighbors, then go into your house with your sons and shut the door behind you. Pour olive oil from your flask into the jars, setting each one aside when it is filled. So she did as she was told. Her sons kept bringing jars to her and she filled one after another. Soon every container was full to the brim. Bring me another jar. She said to one of her sons, there aren't any more, he told her. And then the olive oil stopped flowing. Then she told the man of God what had happened. He said to her, now sell the oil, sell the olive oil and pay your debts and you and your sons can live on what is left over. So presently in Nigeria and in many nations of the world, things are rough, things are tough. And this story that we just read reminds me of that reality. However, <laughs> however, the Spirit of God tells me that just like we had in this story, there will be miracles. Yeah. This month, yeah. miracles of restoration, yeah. resurrection, yeah. resurgence. Yeah. This woman was drowning in debt. Her, her husband had died. And then not only did she lose her husband, she was about to lose her two sons because the creditors were about to take the two sons away. But God launched her out. Somebody is launching out of debt. In the name of Jesus Christ. What was meant to be the worst of times has become the best of times for someone. Financially. And if you are the one I'm talking about, you can say a good amen. amen. At one of our training programs many years ago, one of us walked up to me during break. It was one of the leadership training programs I run for CEOs. He approached me during the break and he was holding a copy of my book, sorry, is it my book? No, his book, because he had paid for it. <laughs> Whose book was it? Okay. <laughs> Start with what you have. And he said to me, small book, he said, sir, my whole business started from this book. It was while I was reading this book that I got inspiration and God gave me the idea of what to do. I started the business from this book. He said, this book has so changed my life, I've given out hundreds of it. He just buys, <laughs> just buys and buys, gives people. He's even conducted Bible study on it, you know, taking people through the book. He said, any challenge that we have in my business, once I pick this book and I'm reading through, I will find a solution. I said, eh? I'm not, I don't know what's in the book, but whenever he reads it, he finds solutions, you know. And what is in the book is from this story. It's from this story. Because many years ago, we did some analysis. Who are the people that live five kilometers radius of our church? What's the age distribution? And the big question, what are their needs? And poverty came number one. Claire, number one. So we asked ourselves, okay, and this story is more than 25 years old, right? What are their needs? Poverty came number one. Okay, so let's look at our church, look at our ministry, look at our activities and ask ourselves, how have we been addressing the poverty problem? Let's check the preaching. And then <laughs> I now realized that the only thing I had been teaching on finances was giving. And I had dug into it. 
how to give, how not to give, who to give to, who not to give to, what to give, what not to give, where to give, where not to give. As I was meditating, you know, reflecting on it, it just dawned on me, oh God, they don't have. All these analyses will just create paralysis. They don't have. Ah! I said, it looks like this is not where to start. I genuinely asked Jesus, the head of the church, is there anything in the Bible I can teach them that will help them to get the money first? Show me. I would rather teach that first than squeeze them and squeeze them and ask, give, give, give the money that is not there. He answered me. And the first answer I got now, it came in waves of revelations. But the first one I got was this passage. And as I read it, right, what occurred to me was this woman's scenario and how many people are in that scenario. What do you do when you don't know what to do? What do you do when you are at your wit's end? What do you do? Right? My first encouragement. Run to God. Run to God. She ran to the prophet. She ran to the prophet. And it's been said that when Christians have problems, they stop coming to church. When people outside have problems, they come to church. What you need is wisdom. What you need is wisdom. God can see what we cannot see. What is complex to us is not complex to God. It's easy. And I'm telling someone here, there is that temptation to assume that because the problem seems complex, the solution also is going to be complex. In fact, retaining that mindset is what will make someone to miss a miracle. Because God delivers the solutions in simplicity. What will surprise someone this month will be how simple it will be for God to give you a massive shift. It's going to come easy. Someone say with me, easy. Run to God because, not because God prints currencies in heaven and they will throw money down at you. Run to God because money is only a means of exchange of value. Basic. Anyone who comes to this town must get that because we don't like to deceive ourselves. Money is only a means of exchange of value. We say it over and over and over until it sinks in. Money has not always been in existence. God did not create money. Man created money. Are we all agreed on that? Because there was a time when money was not in existence. They did trade by butter. Thank you. So you brought something to the market, I brought mine. You brought potatoes, I brought yam. Or you brought tomatoes. Let me use tomato, because that one, everybody understands what's going on with tomatoes now. And how many you have in the basket, okay? Or on the plate. So <laughs> you brought tomatoes, I brought yam. We determined their relative values, the difficulty of producing them, right? and we exchange them. That's how they did transactions. Simple, easy. Or, you helped me to build my house, I gave you two bars of yam. 100. <laughs> After some time, complexity set in. Comple the complexity of making that exchange. Every transaction, you carry yam. You want to pay landlord every month, you carry yams. You want to pay the fashion designer that made your clothes, you carry yam. You want to go by commercial transportation, by taxi, you carry yams, right? <laughs> to, give, to give the taxi driver. It just became complex. And that's when people devised to create items that would represent the value of the yams. Instead of carrying the yams themselves around, carry something that is small that represents the value of the yams. 
Money is only a means of exchange of value. As simple as it sounds, it is confusing many people. Because today, we've learned to think of money detached in our thinking from value. And then it becomes even more confusing when someone becomes a Christian and discovers the secrets of prayer. Ask, and you shall receive. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened to you. For everyone that asks it, receive it. And everyone that seeks it, find it. And the one that knocks it, the door will be opened to you. Father, in Jesus' name, one million. One million, one million. Lord, you say, I ask and I receive it. 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 You know what will happen? Because God cannot lie. You will receive the one million in the spirit. <laughs> Spiritual money. <laughs> to see it manifest down here, you, you need to have value to exchange. Is that okay? The beautiful thing for us who believe in God is the fact that God is the creator of value. He creates it. God is the one that gives value to everyone and everything that is in existence. If you say gold has value, God gave it that value. If crude oil has value, it was God that gave it that value. If you have value, it is God that gave you that value. That's why you should run to him. If, or, or not if, since money is a mix of exchange of value, God gives you that value. God has that value. Good. So, this woman ran to God as poor as she thought she was. God, through the prophet, extracted value out of her life. She ended up with value ready to exchange. Am I right? That's why the story ended. Am I right? She ended up with something to sell. Amen. I know some people don't like this now. They are not enjoying it. Because the testimony we like is, hmm, if you know what happened. Someone just called me on the phone. Just call, just one call. And said, I'm giving you 10 million. You see the way you shouted. That's the one we like, right? <laughs> it's human nature. We like vanity. Human nature loves vanity. For doing nothing. I did not do anything. If you ask, if you ask me now, I can't even tell you how God did it. Uh, he was. <laughs> You don't have anything to sell. You don't have any skill. You don't have any value to add. You are not useful to anybody. And God just gave you like that. So come to this time. We don't think like that. <laughs> but remember, she ran to God. Somebody here needs to camp with God. Amen. Amen. You need to pray. You need to focus on God. The first thing God will do is that he will uncover your value. That's the starting point. God will uncover your value. The first thing he will make you realize is you are not as poor as you think you are. You are not as broke as you think you are. God is the creator of value and he's the giver of value. First thing he will do, uncover your own value. You have value. If you knew who you were, you would not worry, worry for one second. So let me read what Christ said. And the Holy Spirit specifically told me this, that this month someone will kill worry. Amen. Especially over money matters. Amen. The major part of our stress is money. Or what money should do. Right? Good. And when you go by Pareto's principle, once your basic needs are met, you know, food and other things, uh -huh, then you can now worry about level three needs, uh, love and belonging. That's when you now notice the person that is not greeting you when you come to the service. Uh -huh, person that is not greeting you well. Hey, this person does not love me. But who cares about love when you have not eaten? Uh -huh. <laughs> Matthew 6, 26 to 34. Matthew 6, 26 to 34, New Living Translation. Christ himself speaking. Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in bands, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. 
They don't walk or make the clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not addressed as dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things, saying, well, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. And he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. So I bring God's word to someone. Kill worry. Worry never solves any problem. It creates new ones. Kill worry. You are part of a system. Seek first the kingdom of God, the government of God. In the government of God, people don't go without food. We try in this time to align with the biblical model of church as best we can. The day the church was born, in Acts chapter 2, worrying about food was terminated by people. Massive food distribution started. So don't worry about what to eat, what to drink. In God's system, those, those basic needs are automatically met. And it is not prayer. So, I've been searching, trying to find a basis for praying, Lord, bless this food in Jesus' name and provide for those who don't have. I'm looking for it. What I see in the Bible is not prayer. Carry your food and go and give the person. Stop praying. You have food in your house. You are praying that God should provide for those who don't. What do you want God to do? Angels should bring rice <laughs> and bread. <laughs> okay? Because God's kingdom runs on love. That's our basic value. And that value hates to see a human living beneath their dignity. So, in God's system, the basic needs are met. Kill worry. How do you overcome negative emotions? Philippians chapter 4 verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything through prayer and supplication. With what? Thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. Verse 8 says what? Or verse 7 says what? And the peace of God. That passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds through our Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, I declare worry dies. Yeah. Worry is destroyed. Yeah. For someone in the name of Jesus Christ. Good. Someone enters their rest. Yeah. Did I hear you say amen? Yeah. Today. Someone enters their rest. Yeah. When you worry, you have chosen to work on the problem. And God will stand aside since you can handle it. When you enter your rest, you allow God to do the work and he will surprise you. It's easier for him than it is for you. Amen. Amen. Once I was young, now I am old. I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging for bread. Enter your rest. In fact, like we will say, let me cuckoo say this one. Okay, so this is the scenario, right? That things have become difficult for many in our country at this time. And because our church is committed to the Acts of the Apostles model, the biblical model, we, we always, we buy food. We supply raw food every week, practically every day. What we budget now to buy food is five times what we budgeted monthly two years ago. It's an explosion of poverty, right? 
Now, even that is not enough anymore, right? So, I am calling us as God's people today. Mm-hmm. For those of us that God has blessed and we can afford, eh, that we bring food stuff next weekend. Is that okay? If you can get bag of rice, half bag, rice, beans, those are the simple ones to distribute, rice, beans, gari. Let's be the church, right? And for someone, as you do it, God will do something. Yes. Proverbs eleven twenty four. there is one that scatters and yet increases. There is one that withholds more than is necessary. It results in poverty. Mm-hmm. For someone, that's going to be the key. Amen? Amen? For someone, that is going to be the key to a new dimension of supplies of provision, of blessing, in Jesus' name. Is that okay? So the second part that we would pray about, God will uncover the value of what you have. God will uncover the value of what you have that is useful for someone, that will make them give you money in exchange. So when we say, run to God, what do we get from God? Inspiration and revelation. Prophetic inspiration and revelation. That's what we get from God. Prophetic inspiration and revelation. Prophetic inspiration and revelation. One of us here in church, blessed. Blessed. Exceedingly blessed. You know, we've shared his story before. Said the first business he would do, first asset he would acquire in real estate. He was in the service and as I was speaking, he needed 20 million naira. Had no idea how to raise the money. And he was in the service. And he said as I was teaching, he said the Holy Spirit just dropped something in the spirit. You know, just dropped something. Four names. Four names. <laughs> you know, when we ended the service, he just stepped outside, picked, took his phone, called the first one. I need five million naira from you, okay? Interest-free loan, I'll pay you back. The guy agreed. The second person, the third person, the fourth, fourth person, his 20 million naira was complete. That's how he acquired his first asset and he's a multi-billionaire now. During the service, inspiration, God will uncover the value of what you have. What was it that he had? Relationships. Relationships. The money you are looking for is in somebody's hand. It's in town. Only a few people agreed. Yes. The money you need is already in town. It will find its way to you. Yes. Heaven will give you an instruction. Yes. Give you an idea. If God's blessed you before, this month, heaven is shifting your blessing times 10. Yes. This second half of this year is a shift. Yes. Massive shift financially. I'm saying that prophetically. So, pay attention to the ways that you add value. You add value as an employee. That's the starting point. Add value by helping other people to execute their ideas. That's the starting point. You've got to have skills. You've got to have knowledge. You've got to be able to do something. As much as Joseph was a slave, when he found himself in Potiphar's house, he had some skills to add. You've got to be able to do something. You cannot, as a Christian, walk around without having any value to add. Serve as an apprentice to someone. Go to school, attend a course, do something. But you've got to add value to add. And at the lowest level, you help other people to execute their ideas. At the next level of value, you are a manager. In other words, you can supervise five people, ten people, fifty people. I promise you, that's a higher level of value. When they give you goals, they give you the goals that 20 people will achieve, that 50 people will achieve. Many people don't know that that's the thing that is stopping them. They don't pay attention. When we talk about leadership, they don't pay attention. They won't read the book. And you find that they will only give you goals that only one person can achieve until you show that you have that skill. So it's not only enough to have technical skills. You've got to have people skills. 
So some people hit a particular level, they hit a bar, they lose a job. Get another one, hit a bar, lose the job. Because of poor people's skills, right? And you know us, if the person is from Africa, after losing three jobs, the person will conclude that it is because of village people. It's lack of people's skills. At the next level of value, you're a manager. At a higher level, you're a leader. At a higher level, and one of the major skills a leader must have is the ability to sell ideas, to motivate people to come with you to achieve goals. That's taking your people's skills to a higher level. And you've got to be a communicator. You've got to be a communicator. When you want to place people in life, at their levels, listen to their vocabulary. What makes you an expert in any field is vocabulary. What makes you an expert lawyer is vocabulary. Am I right? What makes you an expert doctor is vocabulary. Right? Doctor and doctor. <laughs> is vocabulary. What makes a doctor a doctor is not vocabulary. By the time they call the name of the sickness, any amount they ask you to go and bring, you go and bring it if you don't want to die. <laughs> At the highest level, at the highest level of value, you are a creator. Some people use the word imagineer. At the highest level, you can bring things that are already existing together to create new solutions to solve problems. The prophet said, woman, what do you want me to do for you? Then he followed quickly with the second question. Tell me, what do you have in the house? She said, your handmaid has nothing. That's the first thing she said. And she said, she said except a small jar of oil. She said, that's what I'm asking for. That's all I'm asking for. That's all God is asking for. There is something. And the Holy Spirit told me. And I came and told the church then. The Holy Spirit said, I should tell you, he will never allow you to get to the point where there is nothing around you that he can use to move you to the next level of breakthrough. Pray for him to open your eye to see there's a skill, there's a qualification, there's a relationship, there's an asset you can sell to raise capital. There's something. You are not as poor as you think. Big crowd. No food. Jesus said, tell me, guys, what do we have? He said, ah, only 300 dinari. He said, ah, but 300 dinari, what of bread can't feed anybody? He said, mm -hmm. that's not what I'm asking for. He said, ah, there's a boy here with five loaves of bread and two fish. He said, that's exactly what I'm asking for. Bring them. That's the way God works. So the moment you say, I don't have anything, I don't have anything, you disregard the potential God has put around you, the miracle stops. The potential for a miracle stops. Somebody say with me, I have something that this world needs. I have value to add. This month, I shift to a new level of value addition. If you believe that, say a powerful amen. Say with me, I am a co-creator with God. He said, go and look for empty barriers. Go and look for empty barriers. So the important thing is this. You are not the one that determines the value of what you have. It is the people for which it solves problems. It is the person for which it meets a need that actually defines its value. You have malaria tablets to sell. If I don't have malaria, your tablets are useless to me. That's part of what frustrates people in selling. We'll talk about that later. You are chasing people who don't need what you have. But to the person who is about to die of malaria, your malaria tablet is a lifesaver. Am I right? So whatever that thing is that God gave you, it is a lifesaver for someone. This month, there will be a connection. I said this month, there will be a connection. Joseph had gift for interpreting dreams, right? If I didn't have a dream, your gift is useless to me. 
But then two people had a dream, fellow prisoners. He interpreted dreams for them. Just one of them made his way to the palace. One day, the king had a dream. Then Joseph's gift was needed. As simple as it sounds. A, a foreigner, a slave, a prisoner. But when the whole nation needed what he had, they fished him out. I said in the name of Jesus, the power of God activates. Activates what God has put inside you that is needed at a high level. Financial problems are solved. Resolved. Resolved this month. In the name of Jesus, I prophesy on you revelation. Inspiration. In the name of Jesus, in Luke chapter 5, Peter and his friends tried to catch fish. They caught nothing. Right? Broke. Nothing. Mending their net. Nothing. Nothing. They caught nothing. They said, they caught nothing. They caught. When Jesus came, he said, well, I know you caught nothing. It's fish you were looking for. But your boat has value for the kingdom of God. Can I use your boat to preach? Peter said, use boat. Christ used the boat. When he finished, he turned to Peter. You put God's kingdom first, right? You loaned God your most valuable business asset. He said, launch out into the deep. Throw your nets for a catch. He threw the, the same place where they tried to fish and caught nothing. Fish rushed in and almost pulled them overboard. For someone, that is the missing link. It is the absence of God in the whole equation. Chasing survivor, chasing survivor. Leave survivor. Let God use you. To add value to people. Take the attention away from yourself. Self-centeredness is not going to work in God's system. It doesn't. This system runs on love. Let God use you. Amen. That's why I made a call for food. Some of you may think it's a simple thing. But I put it in the middle of the message deliberately. It's a prophetic instruction. Amen. Prophetic and someone will see. What happened with the widow that fed Elijah? The food never ran out. Through the time when things were difficult, I prophesy on you again in the name of Jesus. One, this month, heaven uncovers your value. Amen. Secondly, heaven uncovers the value of something you have already. And God will use it to create a new level of abundance for you. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I pray for the person that is a part of this service who says, my relationship with God is not okay. Pastor, can we start from there? How can I pray when my relationship with God is not okay? I'm a sinner. I want God to forgive my sins. Can we start from there? Well, every human being was born a sinner. That's where all our problems start as humans. Everyone was born a sinner. So I just want to pray for that honest person who says, I want God to forgive my sins. God sent Jesus to die for us on the cross, okay? God sent Jesus to die for us on the cross. The price has been paid. So if you're that honest person, can you please put your hand on your heart? I want God to forgive my sins right now. Pastor, can you pray with me? You may be at, here at any of our physical locations. You may be here at any of our physical locations. Or you may be a part of the service online. Can you put your hand on your heart and say this prayer after me? Dear God, I ask that you forgive me my sins. I believe that Jesus paid for my sins. And I thank you for your love for me and for hearing my prayer today in Jesus' name. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you for everyone who said this prayer. And thank you, Heavenly Father, because our sins are forgiven. <laughs> thank you, Heavenly Father, because the nature of sin is removed from them and the Holy Spirit has put your nature inside them now. So we ask, Heavenly Father, teach them to know you personally and teach them to love you the rest of their lives. In Jesus' name.